Welcome back, everybody, to Beyond the Shadows. I'm author and ghost story and Mike Ricksecker. We have a fantastic show coming up for you tonight. We're going to be talking about haunted objects. So this is going to be like haunted dolls, Ouija boards. We're going to talk about the W box, all kinds of interesting, crazy things. Feel free to throw in as many questions down into the chat as you want about all kinds of different items. We're even going to be talking about how these items affect us why they may be haunted a lot of different theories as well quarantine ghosts our wonderful chat moderator haunting the chat will be picking up those questions and feeding them my way so this episode of hunter this episode of beyond the shadows is brought to you by haunted road roast helps young ghosts that's our coffee which actually is not haunted even though it's called haunted road roast uh, it's a dark Vienna roast, by the way. You can find that uh, on uh, hauntedroadmedia.com. It's good stuff. I highly recommend it, especially if you like coffee. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this. Another a couple of technical issues to start this off. Victoria down there would tell us it's Mars retrograde. <laughs> uh, but it could be any number of things, right? It's just, it's been a crazy technological day overall but it's also the autumnal equinox so happy equinox this is my favorite time of year i love fall so i was drinking some pumpkin spice coffee earlier not latte pumpkin spice uh with apple nutella and pumpkin fudge oh it's amazing so let's kick into fall Let's get into some haunted objects. We're going to start with, so we've been kind of doing this pattern here um, for a while now where uh, with the Monday video that comes out on the Haunted Road Media YouTube channel, we followed up with more in-depth discussion on Tuesday. So the video that came out yesterday was Robert the Doll, Haunted Doll down there in Key West, Florida. And so today we're talking about haunted objects. We're going to go ahead and start with haunted, uh, the Haunted Robert Doll. Uh, we're not going to get as detailed as that video. We'll just kind of like skim the surface on it. We can talk about, how, we will talk about how and why uh, it was haunted and if it's haunted now, because those are actually some of the major points that I have when it comes to that particular story. Um, it's actually very interesting. And uh, Quarantine Ghost throwing the link down there to uh, get your Haunted Road roast. Appreciate that, QG. Always appreciate it. All right, so let's get into it. All right, there he is, Robert the Doll. <laughs> and Julie says, oh, no, not Robert. Just got him out of my head. Well, we got to start there a little bit. Well, like I said, we won't get as, as detailed. But basically, Robert was a, a gift to uh, to Robert Eugene Otto uh, from his grandmother. She came across him in a store window in Germany and uh, sent him his way because, you know, uh, Gene and his family had just moved into a new house. He was young. He didn't have any friends yet. So uh, his the aunt figured that this doll could, you know, basically serve as a stand-in until Gene made some friends. Now, when the doll showed up, Gene, again, his name was Robert Eugene Otto, um, declared that the doll would then be named Robert and he would be named Gene. So, and then from there, they became, well, too close of playmates. And all kinds of crazy things started happening around the house. Uh, objects were moving, going missing. People would hear two voices when Robert was playing with the doll, or I guess when Gene was playing with Robert the doll. So a lot of crazy things were going on. Um, when the aunt came to visit, she noticed that the relationship between Gene and Robert was like inappropriate. So they tried to get the doll... Uh, she tried to get the parents to put the doll in the attic, and then all of a sudden, the next morning, the aunt ended up dead. Robert was eventually, I keep saying Robert, Gene was eventually sent away to uh, boarding school. He moved back to the house as an adult, and then again, the same sort of antics started um, started happening. His mother was still alive at that point in time for a little while. She kind of warned off. Uh, Robert's Gene's wife <laughs> and um, you know Gene absolutely hated Robert the doll um, 
And so it became kind of a sticking point in the relationship between she and Gene. And then when Gene passed away uh, in 1974, then she packed it away in the attic. And just you know, there are all kinds of crazy stories within the local community because they would see Robert propped up in the top tower window of the house. Now, Gene was a painter, so he'd be up there painting and he'd have Robert in the window. And so then you end up with all these stories. So now with Robert the Doll, he's at this museum in uh, in Key West. And now there's this supposed curse of Robert the Doll in which if you take his photo then bad things are supposed to happen to you. If you take his photo without permission, I should say, that bad things will suddenly happen to you. So people will say, you know, okay, you know, I, I was here, took the photo of Robert, left, got in a car accident, or, you know, my my relationship, uh, you know, was blown apart. Um, all kinds of, you know, maybe they lost a job, all kinds of different personal issues would happen. And so then they would write to Robert and apologize for not asking to take the photo. Please lift the curse. And so in Robert's area there at the museum are like a huge board of all these different letters of people apologizing to Robert and asking for forgiveness. Please lift the curse. Um, and so this goes on to this day. So what's, um, what's interesting to me about this particular haunting like this doll is supposed to be a uh you could call it a cursed item it's supposed to be a haunted object um the stories that have proliferated over the years who won of course you know the the aunt bought it for gene from the shop in germany so there are a number of people that are of the persuasion that there was already a spirit attached to the jaw to the doll from Germany and when she sent it to Jean then you know this spirit acted out through the doll there's another story out there that talks about uh, one of the housekeepers of the Otto family this, they were an affluent family they had housekeepers they lived in a nice house all this that uh, she was from Jamaica, practiced voodoo, and she put a voodoo curse upon the doll, and then therefore, um, all these things just started happening with, with the doll. And so, now that Jean is gone, and this doll is in the museum, then the spirit that's attached to the doll is supposed to be acting out and cursing people. Well, I don't think it's either one of those things. Um... Basically, what, what I believe, and we talk about poltergeist activity, which is different than a poltergeist. So a poltergeist is German for a noisy ghost. This is a type of spirit that will throw objects across the room, knock things over, basically cause a bunch of havoc in the house, knock pictures off walls, stuff like that. That is a poltergeist. Poltergeist activity is somebody who has very strong um, telekinetic energy, what we call PK activity, and they will generate that same sort of activity around them. So they'll be in the house, and whatever happens with them internally whether they're upset or what have you, and then all of a sudden something will go flying off the wall because they got upset. And so this is that telekinesis, that PK activity that's acting out that resembles a poltergeist. So I think what happened with Gene and Robert is that Gene was a very special boy, and he at a young age already had uh, much of this ability, the PK, uh, the telekinesis ability. But because he had developed such a strong attachment, you know, his own personal affections to Robert the doll, that all of his telekinetic energy was 
focused, just hyper focused right into the doll. So when Gene would get upset, um, or even, you know, he was just extremely happy. It doesn't always have to be, you know, him being upset. He could be extremely happy and this energy is manifesting, but it's manifesting itself directly into the doll. So, you know, Gene talking about, well, the doll's moving, the doll's doing this, the doll is, you know, causing the problems. Um, it was Gene's energy making the doll do that. So he would, to him, seem like the doll had its own personality. There were even stories about when Gene was an adult and living in the house, and he still he had Robert out. He, of course, grabbed him from the attic, and he had him out and about. And he would, when he would have visitors to the house, he would actually sit Robert in the room you know, while he's entertaining guests. And depending on the conversation, people would claim that the facial features on Robert the doll would change. Well, with Gene and his attachment and his him being hyper focused into that doll, if he didn't like something that was being said in the conversation, but he doesn't want the others to know. I think as an adult, he probably had it figured out by then that he was making it happen. Um, and something's happening in that conversation or something's being said in that conversation that he doesn't like, but he doesn't want to make that known. He could passive aggressively have Robert the doll make a funny face or like a scowl or whatever. So that's what I think was going on with the original haunting of Robert the doll. I think it was all Gene. But now, I mean, Gene's gone. He's been dead since 1974. And now we have Robert the doll at a museum with this supposed curse. Well, again, I don't think it's some spirit from Germany that's with Robert the doll now at this museum. I don't think it's some voodoo curse or whatever that's with Robert the doll now. I think it's still Gene. I think when Gene passed away, he stayed with the doll. And so if there's any haunting going on with Robert the doll right now, it's still Gene, just Gene has now passed away. And so he has become the attachment to the doll at the museum and any of this weird, funny stuff that happens. I think a lot of the, you know, I got in a car accident, I broke up with my boyfriend, um... You know, lost my job. I think a lot of that stuff is, you know, probably coincidental. Um, I mean, there may be some things that Gene does, you know, to some of these people, you know, if he doesn't like them, he might spook them there at the museum or what have you. But I still think, what you know, that the actual haunting of Robert the Doll has always been Gene. It was Gene when Gene was alive, and it was Gene now that Gene is, has passed away. I think this entire time it's always been Gene. So we have a question here from Alina the Fam. Mike, did you ever see Robert in person? Would you want to? Um, I have not yet seen Robert in person. Um, Ghosty, not this specific Ghosty, but Ghosty has seen Robert. Uh, Ghosty has been down there at Key West and uh, has actually met Robert himself. Uh, somewhere, if you go to Ghosty's Facebook page, there's some photos uh, there of Ghosty and Key West. Um, that would have been my friend Sabrina that brought him down there. But um, yeah, what I what I find funny about the whole picture taking thing now is that it's gone beyond the the legend has got, gotten so misconstrued that not only is it this thing where people are asking to hey Robert can can I take your photo for one if you ask Robert to if you can take his photo how do you know if he has said yes or no you know it's it, it, there's there's nothing I've never seen a video of somebody asking Robert Robert may I take your photo and Robert responding yes or no that, that just doesn't happen. So I don't know how these people know if they've gotten permission or not to take his photo. 
But the the other thing that has come out of this now, because um, I did, um, it was probably almost a year ago now, on TikTok, I've been taking like the Friday Night Ghost Rites, which are now on Mondays, and putting them one minute segments out there on TikTok. And uh, last year I had a Haunted Dolls video that went through not just Robert, but a number of different Haunted Dolls. But with the Robert the Dolls section that I put out there on TikTok, uh, a lot of those kids out there, because TikTok is like very heavily on the younger side. Um, but you know, introducing them to some of these ghost stories. Um, a lot of them were apologizing to my video, <laughs> apologizing to Robert for looking at his photo. So, you know, now the legend is getting twisted from, you know, taking the photo to just looking at his photo and they're apologizing, you know, please forgive me for looking at your photo. So, you know, this is like a, we're spiraling down the rabbit hole with this thing. Um, it's getting a little crazy. So, um, so that is Robert the doll. You guys are, are free to ask additional questions, uh, about that or other haunted doll questions. Um, I, I could have done like a whole thing on haunted dolls and we, we kind of have, I think we have done an old inside the upside down episode on haunted dolls. Um, uh, Betty Lange, what do you think of buying a Robert the doll replica? I think it's completely harmless. Um, I, I think, okay, here's the thing. Um, I think that buying a replica on the surface is completely harmless. However, through intent, you can, of course, manifest activity surrounding that doll. If you buy that replica doll and keep talking about it being Robert the doll and the doll is supposed to do this and it's supposed to do that and it's going to curse people and, da, 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 and you, basically you are taking those thoughts and manifesting them into the doll because you keep talking about it. Well, if you don't want, if you buy that replica doll and you don't want the stuff that's supposed to be associated with it to happen, don't talk about it like that. Because otherwise you're going to manifest it with that replica doll. I, but on the surface, the doll's harmless. You as a person with your energy and your in, intentions can make something happen. So don't. <laughs> um, all right. So what we have on tap next, that is Robert the doll, um, the Dubiak box. Now... A lot of misconceptions here as well with the WX box. There are many. There's not just one. Um, yes, Zach Bagans has one in his haunted museum, but that is not the only one in existence. So basically what these things are, are they are supposed to um, contain a demon. This is a uh, this is a thing out of Jewish mysticism. Now, the, the one that Zach has was... Um, Basically, it was bought on eBay. The person that bought it thought it would make a very cool wine cabinet. Uh, the woman who it previously belonged to was like 103 years old, and it, um, it was supposed to have a demon with you know inside of it. And then when the person that bought it for the wine cabinet opened it up, all hell supposedly broke loose. So, um, so Zach bought it, and it's in his haunted museum. But again, it's not, it's not the only one. Um, there are many others out there. This is kind of a, a traditional thing that if you have, um, well, I mean, it's, it's almost like a, a Jewish kind of exorcism. So a house has um, some sort of severe haunting going on, or they think they have a, a demon in the household. They bring in the box. They do their... Uh, you know, their rites and their um, ceremonies and, and what have you to, to take that spirit that's in the house or within the person and put it into the box. And then you keep the box sealed. And that's supposed to, you know, 
you know, keep that entity um, captured within there. So they don't open it. Um, there's all kinds of WX boxes that you can like find on eBay and what have you now. Um, the majority of them are simply going to be somebody went into their garage and they created a replica and they put it out there and they're trying to sell you on that it contains a demon. I think that's what a lot of these, um, you know, most of these haunted objects on eBay are. They just you got a piece of junk in their house and they just, you know, throw it up there on eBay and say, it's haunted. And, you know, they're like, oh, it's kind of a creepy, cool object. It must be haunted. No, um, most of them are not. Uh, but as far as like a real W box, um, you know, does it contain a demon? You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I have not encountered one that that truly does but how do i want to say this um and alina the fam asking the question is it true there's only a few real ones in existence well that's kind of true with any of this stuff there are there are there are real ones but there are few and far between just demons in general there are real demons but they're few and far between uh so same with the w boxes But, um, you know, I have been, I've been on a demon case, okay? I mean, the, and, and I've been involved some way, shape, or form in the paranormal for like 30 years. One demon case. And in that particular instance, um, it was there in the house. It was tormenting the girl. It was trying to take possession of her, and we got the thing out of there. Um, now, we didn't put it into a box. We pushed it out basically through the house and out the backyard, if we had tried to put that into a box, would it have stayed in the box? I'm not sure. Um, you know, is there a way that you can force something to stay within a container? Well, you know, you look at like the Annabelle doll. That's supposed to have a um, you know, spirit attachment to it. And supposedly this glass case in the wards that they've put up around it are supposed to keep it sealed in. Well... I suppose I have to stay to my own word here in which many, many times I've said, if you truly believe in something with your whole conviction, then that thing will happen. You know, we, we were talking manifestation just a moment ago. Um, you know, I always talk about this when it comes to protection because people will ask me, what do you do, you know, to protect yourself? Um, and, or, you know, what, what do you believe is a good protection for paranormal investigations? And so I see people do all kinds of different things to protect themselves to go going into a paranormal investigation, whether it's, you know, a prayer or a talisman or stones or a necklace, or they get together and they do like a whole group thing beforehand. Um, those people, if they truly have an absolute conviction that that whatever the heck it is that they're doing or holding or possessing or whatever is going to protect them, then it will. So if there's a demon running around the house and you have that utter conviction that you're putting this thing into the box and are sealing it inside the box, then who's not to say that your energy could do that and you manifest putting this demon into the box. So, um, so I want to rule that out. I think it's possible. Joy H, I can deal with spirits, but clowns, <laughs> right? A lot of people don't like the clowns. I, I've never had a problem with clowns. Um, I had one clown, uh, performer at one of my birthday parties when I was a kid, Jingles the Clown. And he was fantastic. We had a lot of fun. Um, no problem. So, and they were always funny at the circus. They're the ones doing all the goofy stuff. Now, people make clowns look creepy, you know, but okay. Um, so, let's see. Victoria Monday, all joking aside, Dragon's Blood Oil really does help with protection. 
uh, psi vamps, migraines. Cool. Okay. So we'll move on from the WX box. If you guys have any else, anything else to ask about it, that's fine. Throw it down there. Um, did want to talk about Ouija boards for a little bit and whether or not Ouija boards are actually haunted or because you hear these stories, okay, a Ouija board being used to communicate with spirits, fine. But I also hear these things about, um, you know, a spirit being trapped inside the Ouija board or a demon being attached to a particular Ouija board. And I'm not so keen on all of that. Um, I, I think where people come into problems with the Ouija board, and, and I get asked this question a lot, you know, what's what's your opinion, you know, on the Ouija board? Um, you know, would you use one? Um, I haven't been trained on how to use a, a Ouija board, so I don't know if I would use one in particular. I think it comes down to you have to know what it is you're doing with it. Um, and to me, it's also a lot easier to just use an audio recorder. You know, that's kind of easy. I think what, what happens is, um, you know, Ouija board is marketed for kids. You know, it's, it's marketed as a game. And so kids buy it. Um, you know, they have a slumber party one night and they're being goofy with the thing. And, you know, one person is trying to make it move. And the other person is trying to make it move to spell out, you know, words like, you know, oh, you know, um, you know, what's the name of the, the boy that likes me, that sort of stuff. Now, it is a communication tool, talking board for spirits. Now, imagine you're a spirit nearby the area, and you pick up on, people are trying to talk to me because of, you know, the energy from, from the board reaching out, kind of like a beacon, hey, you know, there's a mode of communication over here. And you enter the room and you see the slumber party going on and they're being all goofy and you definitely don't want to, you know, be asking about, you know, who's my boyfriend, you know, questions and stuff like that. And so, and it gets to be disrespectful. Like, you know, you, you as a spirit, you're trying to communicate because there's people using the board trying, supposedly trying to communicate and they're being all goofy. And so you get upset because they are not actually trying to listen to you. They're trying to fool each other. And so that's when, like, suddenly the radio goes flying across the room or what have you. Or the plant check gets, you know, thrown across the room. That's when you have these spirits that get upset and crazy things happen with the, with the Ouija board. Because the people that were using it didn't know how to use it properly and they didn't have the respect for the spirits to use it. I do know of people who used... Ouija boards all the time to talk with spirits um, and they know how to properly use it and have that right uh, proper respect and also how to close out the session properly I gotta ask though what, what do you think about that little Ouija board and uh, it doesn't it really have a, a small enough planchette I know a lot of you have thought this was a watch it's actually a little tiny Ouija board in there <laughs> um, yeah so People do know how to use it as a proper communication device, but most people don't. And so that's why a lot of people end up getting in trouble with it. I don't think Ouija boards on their own are inherently haunted, um, but they are a device for trying to communicate with spirits and can a attract a spirit in there to haunt the location. Um, you know, a, a spirit being attached to a Ouija board. I really don't see why a spirit would want to be attached to a Ouija board. That seems a little strange. <laughs> so like a, a logical spirit attachment to an object. I'll give you an example here. Um, there was a woman that I worked with by the name of Donna. This was years ago. Um, and it was when I had started writing or doing the research for the Ghosts of Maryland book. And she was somebody that I worked with at the library system in, in Maryland. We were both in the IT department there. And so when I started, hey, I got this book contract. I'm you know doing this 
this book. So she told me about um, her father. So when when he passed away, she and her sister were cleaning out their father's house. They were getting rid of things. They were going to sell things. You know, take take some things home. Whatever they were getting the house ready to sell. Well, their father was a amateur ham radio operator. It was his hobby, and so he had like all of his equipment set up in the basement. And um, yeah, they he would just spend hours and hours down there playing with the the ham radio. Well, as they were cleaning out the house, the radio would kick on, the channels would change, all that stuff would be going on. And this would happen again and again and again. They go down there, turn it off, and you know they go back up, work some more, and then boom, it would turn on again, and <laughs> they'd go down there again, turn it off. So the, uh, they ended up having to tell their father to stop. They knew it was him. They knew that he was in death, still playing around with the radio. Well, that's a that's a spirit attachment there to that radio because that was his hobby that was his favorite thing to do was to go down there and play with the with the radio and it makes sense as to why because you know of his fondness for this particular hobby but with the Ouija board unless it was like you know a similar situation in which it was a particular person's Ouija board and it was something that they always enjoyed doing that they I don't know they they couldn't go a day in their life uh, in their life without you know communicating with the spirits with the Ouija board and, or whatever um you know that's I, I I could possibly see that um yeah but <laughs> But just inherently, oh, we bought a Ouija board, you know, we're, we're trying to call out the spirits. There's not a reason for that spirit to just suddenly become attached to the Ouija board. Now, they could show up in the house because you called out to them with the Ouija board and maybe suddenly they've decided to get attached to you because you're interesting. Or maybe, you, you know, you pissed them off so much with that session that they're just going to haunt the hell out of you now. That could be but they're not just going to attach themselves to the Ouija board. Um, all right, you guys got any questions uh, on that at all? We're kind of flying through a lot of these uh, topics here. So, um, all right. So I guess we'll move on a little bit here to the next topic. That is the Ouija board. Then there's the crying boy painting. And I know that those listening to the podcast are not seeing all the images I'm throwing up, but I, I believe I'm talking enough about each particular subject that you don't necessarily need the images. But those that are listening to the podcast edition of this on KGRARadio.com, we do appreciate you listening to us out there on KGRARadio.com. All right. It's a crying boy painting. Okay, we'll get to this in a moment. I see a question down there from Victoria Monday. Mike, if someone made a board, their energy is in the board. That could create magic or an attraction. Same thing as a kitchen witch putting their intention into the food made with love. Um, okay, yeah, I could see that scene. That's a little bit different. Um, if they made the board or they are... Because there are people that make custom Ouija boards. Some of them are really beautiful. I mean, like with the... Uh, um, you know, with with the tarot cards, I mean, I love the artwork and tarot cards. Um, I, I do like a lot of those uh, custom made Ouija boards. See, something like that I could see because they've put their heart and soul into this object. You know, just like the example I gave with my friend Donna, he had his heart and soul into that ham radio. So, yeah, you could have somebody who has created their own Ouija board, and they've put their heart and soul into that work. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And your other example was with the uh, food, putting their intention to the food made with love. Yeah, um, it, it it does all go back to your intention, and even those that have passed away, what is their intention? Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is that um, 
you know, somebody buys the Stranger Things Ouija board, you know, from Target, takes it home, they're having a slumber party, um, and they do have a spirit respond. I don't think that spirit is suddenly going to attach themselves to the, the Stranger Things Ouija board, but there may be a reason it decides to stick around. Um, but yeah, somebody who's actually made their own, I could certainly see that, you know, their, their energy is going to be associated with that board because that was, that was their thing. So, um, so, all right, let's go ahead and get to the, uh, the crime boy paintings. So these are, these are kind of creepy. Um, there are many of these. There's a whole series of crying boy paintings and the crazy thing about this is that they would be discovered in houses that had burned down. A lot of uh, you know firefighters started noticing this. You know, house would burn down, and boom, there'd be like this painting there, you know, unscathed. And you know, after this happened, I mean, it would happen once, okay, fine, but then it would happen again and again. So it's not like every house that burned down had one of these things in it. But they were noticing that there were several of uh, several of the houses that had burned down that they were finding these crime boy paintings. Now, there, there is an interesting note that um, the veneer used on these paintings, and like I said, there are several different ones, and they were mass-produced. Uh, the veneer on there actually had a fire retardant on it. However, that doesn't account for the frame. So, you know, for the skeptics that try to use that veneer as, well, well yeah, it's not burning because of that. Um... Now, also keep in mind, you know, something like that doesn't completely fireproof a, you know, a painting. I mean, like I said, the frame, of course, went unscathed as well. And if you have a house that goes up in flames and it becomes a, you know, blazing inferno, um, that, that veneer, yeah, it's a fire retardant, but it's not completely fireproof. So the thing would burn at some point. Um so the legend with these things is that, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, the paintings were cursed and they were causing the fires, of course, it is the way it ends up going. Now, does that mean these are, are haunted objects? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think it goes back again to... Um, you know, to intent and manifestation. So you have this this painting up like this in your home. You're viewing this every single day. Let's go back and look at that again. So when you look at this this painting, what are the emotions it evokes? You know, what starts coming into your mind when you view this painting? Well, it's nothing good, right? I mean, you feel bad for them. You know, there's sadness. Um, you, since you don't know why he's actually crying, there's going to be a lot of different possibilities that come into your mind as to why he's crying. You know, is he hungry? Is he homeless? Is he abused? So some of these ideas may actually make you angry. Um, so... If you're, you know, if it's giving you emotions of, you know, sad, angry, you know, depressed, what have you. So, um, so now this is what's going through you and that more negative energy is starting to build up and build up and build up. Every time you view this thing, you're, it's, you know, putting that emotion through you and then you're putting this more negative energy out into the atmosphere. So while the painting itself may not necessarily be cursed or haunted and starting the fire, you could have enough buildup of a negative type of energy within your house that 
that could be a possible catalyst to something negative happening to your house. And then perhaps that negative thing that happens to your house ends up being a fire. So you have to be very careful with um, the type of things that you surround yourself with. Um, you know, if you surround yourself with negative things, then that gives you more of a pro- proclivity to having negative things manifest around you. So it's always better to keep positive things around you rather than negative. You keep positive things around you, then you have more of a proclivity to manifest good things. So, um, you know, it's kind of, (laughs) there's an old saying that, uh, you know, success is simple, you know, good fruit, good, good trees bear good fruit, bad trees bear bad fruit. So, This is kind of that same mentality. Positive things around you will help you to uh, build a positive atmosphere around you, while negative things around you will help to uh, build negative things around you. So it's it's the whole idea of manifestation. So, um, all right, let's see what else you guys have down here in the chat. We've got about 20 minutes left in the show. Um, so Julie fed the curse rumor didn't originate until the 1980s though. Yeah, it, it took a while for that to, uh, uh, to spread, you know, cause it, it wasn't like these paintings went out and all of a sudden a bunch of houses went up in flames. It was like over several years and then they started noticing a little bit of a pattern and, and then the story started to spread. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not one of those that's like, boom, you know, all these houses burned. Um, Rick Gabbert, are there any other copies of this painting or just one of them? No, there's, there's a number of copies of the painting. They were mass produced and there's actually different variations, uh, of the crying, uh, the crying boy. So this is just one of them. Uh, there are other boys like different from him, uh, that are also crying. I mean, what is it like five or six different ones? Um, something like that. So, but this is one of them. Um, and they were produced, I want to say they were produced in the 1950s. Fungi, fungi, can clothing be haunted? Interesting. Um, you know, I would say that if you had um, somebody's favorite hat that they wore every single day, like back when like back when guys wore hats, Um you know, maybe a fedora from the 1940s and there was, you know, some guy that, you know, just loved his hat or whatever. Um, sure, why not? Um, you know, maybe he decided to stick around with it. So, I mean, spirits could elect to attach themselves to most any object. They would, they would have to have a reason, usually a reason for it, um, you know, cause I don't think, you know, some spirit's going to come along and say, you know, I, I think I'm going to hang around with that cap to the water bottle. I mean, they could, but you know, what's the likelihood of it? But if their favorite hat is still around, sure. Why not? Tom McNicholas. Hey, good to see you, Tom. Hope work went well tonight. How can you contain a haunted artifact if you own one? Is a glass case actually safe? Yeah, that's kind of like the Annabelle thing. And uh, we talked about the Dubuque box earlier. So you know, I'll go back to what I answered before. Um, I think if your, your intention is there, if you wholeheartedly believe that what you're doing is going to seal this thing in there, then that will create uh, a strong enough ward to be able to do that. Um, you know, I, th- I think that your intention has to be that absolute and concrete, though. Uh, so even if you're putting, you know, you're throwing all this, I don't know, salt on it, and you're putting these different talismans and cards and symbols and all that, I, mean, you, I think you could put as much of that stuff on there as you want or as little, but I think it's, it's your intent of what you're doing that this is absolutely going to do it and we're 
people run into problems is they start doing all this stuff, but somewhere in the back of their mind, they're like, eh, I don't know if this really works. Like, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Mm. But I mean, and externally, they may be saying, oh yeah, this is going to work. They have to have that conviction internally as well. They can't just like be um, creating a facade for like, let's say there's like, I don't know, three or four people that are going through all this stuff to try to seal something in there. And, you know, the one person's kind of leading the group in this and the others are like learning or what have you. And the person that's kind of walking through it is, you know, putting on a facade for these other people. But internally, there's like, I don't know if this stuff really works, but, you know, we'll throw it on there and, you know, I got, I got to, you know, try to teach these people and make it look like I know what the hell I'm doing. Um, yeah, that's not going to do the job. You have to, you know, balls to bone, you know, believe that this is going to work. And it's that absolute conviction that creates that strong energy to make that happen. Just like with anything else in life, um, you have that absolute balls to bone conviction of something you will make it happen that's how you manifest so you can manifest you know trapping a spirit in a box if you really want so um what else you guys got victoria monday is working on a research paper cool i'll kind of scroll through here a little bit and um, quarantine goes throwing links down in there. That's to the merch section. What is that for the uh, for the coffee <laughs> or ghosty? Okay, yeah, yeah, ghosty. Ghosty's not really haunted. I suppose you can make them haunted, right? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, ghosty met Robert earlier. All right. Let's see. I'm just scrolling through here a little bit. Robert Hanna. Hey, Mike. There was an old Unsolved Mysteries episode about a family who moved into a house in a town I happened to once live. And because of a bunk bed they made for their kids, the house became haunted. Um, I guess I need a little more information about that because I don't know. I guess I don't quite understand. They just made a bunk bed and suddenly it was haunted. So there would have to be there has to be something else going on there other than just making a bunk bed. Um, so, um, Sarah, uh, Yusuf, eventually gaining ownership, you add your own, uh, energy layer to the history of the object. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, anytime we own something, there's a little bit of ourselves that go with it. Oh, quarantine ghosts would haunt uh, their favorite chat room. Very cool. And Haglin, interesting comment. Definitely feel essence from certain pieces of clothing, hat, jewelry of loved ones. Well, you know, and that's of course that's kind of interesting with uh, with like fair family heirlooms, um, like a um, I don't know, like your mother's wedding ring or you know something like that. Um, you know, something that was on them or with them every single day of their life, you know that there's going to be some energy transference there that, um, that when you, you know, take that ring, maybe you put the ring on a chain around your neck, you kind of get a, you know, more of a sense of they're with you. It's not necessarily haunted. It's not like, it's not necessarily that their spirits attached to it or, or what have you, but that's more of, you know, some of their energy is embedded into the object so that when you have it near you, you actually get that sense of them being nearby, even if they really aren't, even if, you know, they've, their, their spirit is maybe it's elsewhere in the world or it's passed on to somewhere up in the afterlife or what have you, um, their energy has passed into that particular object. And so you're able to, you know, really feel part of them there. And 
So it was kind of mentioned earlier, every time, you know, somebody comes in contact with an object, there's, you know, a little bit of an energy transference, but, um, you know, some people are, it, it's going to be so negligible. I mean, you know, an object could pass the, you know, hands of, you know, of about, you know, 20, 30 people or whatever. And so for most of those people, you're not really going to feel, although technically, you know, some of their energy is probably going to be there, but for something like an heirloom item from a family member, that energy is really, really going to be embedded in there. And you may not feel it a hundred percent of the time, but there are going to be times that you really do feel it. So, um, interesting Victoria my day my debt my bed is about 165 years old even my grandpa died on my bed new mattress I would hope so um but yeah there's a huge family connection there you can feel it yeah and so that's another one I, you know when you sleep in a bed you know your your body is near that item for many many hours so the material in that bed is going to soak in uh, good part of, the, of that person's energy so when you're there yourself you are going to feel uh, some of their energy emanating from that um, you know it's again that whole idea of the connected universe and we're connected to you know all these things that are around us and the more that we are around you know a particular object or what have you there is that back and forth energy transfers. All of this around us is just vibrating material. So even, you know, my, my body parts. Um, so you exchange those as you are in contact with an item, you exchange those vibrations back and forth and they start to become a little bit in sync with each other. So it's not, it's not like I'm going to suddenly, you know, become the bed or whatever, but, um, you know, those vibrations from me, and the vi <clears throat> excuse me, the vibrations from the object are going to have those moments where they exchange energy together. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. We have a couple other comments here that. QG is sent my way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we get toward the end of the show and it gets late at night like this, and I start to, my voice starts to lose it. I apologize. Victoria Monday at Mike. Uh, in general, I give off a snow white aura. I think that helps keep the darkness away. Like turn on a light and the dark is gone. Um, well, we each, you know, we all vibrate in a different way we all have a different resonance and so um yeah and people are able to see that type of resonance from your aura so does that keep some of the darkness away probably yeah yeah because you're you're resonating at a different level than them and so that could certainly push away uh things that are more dark in nature uh, rick gabber can objects that were used in a civil war hospital have something attached to them and be haunted um, well, I mean, I think civil war hospitals in general are probably going to be haunted because uh, you would have had a lot of people die in there. Um, and so some of those, um, poor soldiers probably don't even realize that they have passed away, uh, cause some of the objects themselves in there be haunted. Possibly if you had a, uh, you know, object again, kind of close and personal to, uh, one of those soldiers who had died and he may be hanging around it for some particular reason. Um, you know, it's in a situation like that, again, it's kind of hard to know. I mean, you'd have to do a lot of investigating because you're going to, in a, that type of location, you're going to have a lot of different spirit energy to muddle through. You know, from those spirits who died to, um, you know, just the the energy, the, the residual energy from the tragedy itself. So even if there are intelligent haunts there from, you know, spirits who didn't know that they passed away, you know, all those people that were brought in with all of that tragedy, um, 
they're expelling that energy, that trauma, you know, right into the very pores of the building. So you may end up with a lot of residual haunts that way as well. And then, you know, like we were saying, if there's a close personal item that was, you know, left behind there and it still, you know, becomes a part of the museum later on, okay, you know, so something could stay with that item. So that's going to take some work. Uh, places like that are is an interesting dichotomy. Um, they're easy to investigate and hard to investigate as well. They're easy because you are most likely going to get some activity, and you can sit there and say, "Woohoo!" You know, I got some paranormal activity. Um, that's if you're just, you know, somebody who's collecting evidence, if you're an evidence collector, if you're just, you know, one of those people that are like, yup, I got, you know, an EVP and yup, I got, you know, some shadow activity on video or whatever. Um, but those that are trying to, uh, you know, learn more about the people who had been there, more about the history of the location, um, you know, trying to, you know, build a relationship with the spirits that are there and to learn more about these specific people, it's a lot more challenging because you have so much more of that energy within that building and there's likely going to be several spirits within there. So that makes that a little bit more difficult in that respect. Um, all right. So what else do you guys have? Sarah Yusuf, I'd be interested in seeing a study on how energy imprints on the different materials, like how residual hauntings may happen with areas of high limestone or quartz. Well, um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very uh, common belief that materials like limestone, quartz, uh, that they, they really supercharge an area for this type of activity. Um, now, of course, you have the uh, concept of stone tape theory where you know the energy gets retained and then there's some sort of catalyst that makes that kick off and you're able to see basically a playback of something that had happened there but yeah limestone quartz uh they're supposed to you know really be fantastic conductors for this um you know, water nearby uh, does that as well so um we see that quite a bit all right what are we sworn to secrecy about? Um, oh, Quarantine Ghost. There's going to be some cool changes coming up with Haunted Road Media, just like Victoria Monday predicted in the last show. Yeah, there's a lot of new stuff coming up with Haunted Road Media. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff on tap, actually. Um, you know, it was just in Rhode Island this past weekend. A lot of stuff went down. <laughs> uh, there's a big project that's involved there. A uh, smaller one will be coming out. Uh, this coming Monday, and those that are part of the Patreon page are going to get a lot of extras. You guys are getting a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff and sneak peeks and extra footage coming up here very, very soon. So be on the lookout for all of that stuff. All right. So let's go ahead and thank you, Quarantine Ghost, for putting the link in there. Absolutely appreciate that. And Tom McNicholas, Joliet present is mostly limestone. Yeah. And that was, okay, so you guys, a lot of you guys know that I was at the uh, the Conjuring House uh, this past weekend. And, you know, that entire foundation, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we were down in the basement and Corey Heinsohn was showing me the construction. And, you know, they got these big limestone blocks down there. It, granite in some areas as well but limestone is of course again one of those um those conductors for that type of energy of course there's the well right there in the basement as as well so you have the water you have the limestone they do claim that it's on uh a ley line i'd have to do a little more research to confirm that but a lot of people have said that it is so then you'd have the tellura currents running underneath the earth there as well so okay you've got the you know, you've got the Earth's magnetic energy, you've got the the water in the well, you've got the limestone in the building. It's kind of like, yeah, no wonder <laughs> there's so much going on there. Uh, it's pretty, pretty cool. All right. So um, here we go. Let's go ahead and get to the shout outs. I really do appreciate everybody tonight. You've been wonderful. Appreciate all the questions. And for sticking around 
till, uh, well, it's midnight, almost midnight here in the east. I want to thank Quarantine Ghost for haunting the chat, feeding me all the questions, and keeping you guys entertained down there. <laughs> all right. Let's get to the... Uh, dun, 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 dun. Deep down the rabbit hole, Patreon patrons, Tom McNicholas, B3 Airspace, Andrew Cox, Dustin Samario, David Yisley, and Joe Chandler. Thank you all for being deep down the rabbit hole, Patreon patrons. And of course, thank you to our other Patreon patrons as well. I know there are several of you out there. Patreon.com slash Haunted Road Media. And QG was just putting the link down there. So uh, Tom is asking, are they giving tours at the farmhouse? Yes, yes. Um, they, they're doing uh, the paranormal investigations there. So you can, uh, well, if you're out in Rhode Island, you can uh, certainly partake in one of those. I've been doing that since, I guess, last year. Ever since the, uh, after the Ghost Adventures episode aired. Um, is basically, Ghost Adventures got exclusivity until after their episode aired, and then other people were able to uh, jump in there. All right, so let's get to the participants tab. We've got uh, Andrew and his trucking gnomes. Great to see you there, Andrew. Uh, there's Betty Lange, grand old folks. Carrie Parrish, thank you very much once again. Kathy Salento, thank you as well. Alina the fam, as always. Helen Espinoza and Jennifer Bloomer, thank you very much. Joy H. and Julie Fett, thank you both very, very much. Nick Moulet's in the house, and Pungai Fungi, great to see you. Robert Hanna, thank you as well. Sarah Youssef, thank you for joining us tonight. There's Sharon Lane and Christopher Stanton, the Stanton's Journeys. Tammy Heitzman, thank you as always. The Haglin, there's Tom McNicholas. Can't wait to call him Super Chat Superstar again. Of course, everybody who ever did a Super Chat was a Super Chat Superstar, but everybody associated that with Tom. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, there's Tracy Christian, and of course, my co host is Victoria Monday. Let's go back here and see if there's anybody that the participants tab may have missed, which I know Adam Tiller's probably lurking out there. Um, so let me scroll through here, see if there's anyone else. And um, I don't know, that may have been it. I know I got. Yeah. All right. I guess it probably. I guess it got most everybody. All right. Oh, there's Katie Palmer. See, she wasn't on the list. Jason King raising the hand. There we go. All right. So uh, next week on Edge of the Rabbit Hole, we have May Hernan coming back. Uh, May is handling the Haunted Ireland tours. So we had her on earlier in the year. Actually, on St. Patrick's Day to talk about Haunted Ireland. Well, we're going to be talking about more Haunted Ireland coming up next Tuesday. Of course, we also have the Haunted Ireland tour. Actually, it's the uh, Ancient Mysteries of Ireland next uh, July, July 1st through the 9th. So we're going to be talking about all of that next week on the Edge of the Rabbit Hole channel, the Edge of the Rabbit Hole show, starting at 9.30 Eastern. So... All right, guys. I hope you guys have a great week. Uh, and oh, there, did I miss Rick Gabbert? Okay. So I got. I hope you guys have a great week. A lot of things coming up from Haunted Road Media. So stay tuned and be safe out there. Till next time.